church. My scripture today is Psalms 113 verse 1 to 6 from the Message Bible. Hallelujah, you who serve God, praise God, just speak his name, just to speak his name is praise, praise. just to remember God is a blessing, now and tomorrow and always. From east to west, from dawn to dusk, keep lifting up all your praises to God. God is higher than anything or anyone, outshining everything you can see in the skies. Who can compare with God, our God, so majestically enthroned, surveying his magnificent heavens and earth? Praise, Praise the Lord. Praise you, Jesus. This is our nation. This is our land, this is our future, this is our home, a land of reaping, a land of harvest, this is our land, this is our home, this is our nation, this is our land, this is our future. This is our home, a land of reaping, a land of harvest. This is our land, this is our home. This is the great land of the Holy Spirit. Red or red dust plains and summer rains to the sunburn. Sea of love to this great south land, his spirit come. This is our nation, this is our land, this land of plenty, this land of hope, the richest harvest is in her deep. We see revival, His Spirit comes. We'll do that one again. And we want to see revival in this land, don't we? This is our nation. This is our land. This land of plenty. This land of hope. The richest harvest. Is in her people's we see revival, his spirit comes. This is the place of land of the Holy Spirit. Let 
and a bread of space and summer rains to the sunburned land we will see a flood to the streets of land his spirit comes this is our nation this is our land this lucky country of dreams gone dry and to these people we see a harvest and to his land revival comes this is the great south land of the holy spirit Falling is falling. 
keep in that attitude of prayer and worship. Thank you, Lord. Just keep praying for, playing for a little bit more, Mary. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. 
Just reach out to Jesus, your Saviour, your Lord, your friend, to God, your Father, to the Holy Spirit, who is our enabler, our comforter. We praise you, Lord. We magnify you. Thank you, Jesus. Just keep your hearts open. Now, Sister Lillian's got something to say. Um, This this word is for... um, for someone, a particular man in particular, um, uh, he's not a young man, I um, don't know his name, but it's someone who has been um, seeking God uh, about something and I feel he's stirring in my spirit too, that there's been a stir in his spirit and he, um, he's been saying to the Lord, uh, Lord, is there something wrong that I feel this stirring and, and it isn't about that, it's about... Um, God's, God's offering you, God, God's op- offering his, uh, a gift to you. His, his, um, you. You know, you have, I see that you've lived a good life you, as a result of um, probably your heritage and, and I see that uh, you probably would describe yourself as being um, at ease and, and, um, uh, and, and content. Um, but, but you've had this stirring in your spirit in, in your spirit, and you've been asking God to show you what it is, and 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 asking for a word from God, and 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 God God wants to give you a gift, um, a part of Himself that's going to be something very different to um, what you have um, been doing up until this point in time. Um, I sense that that's come to a stop anyhow. Uh, what you have been doing, and and and. Um, God's offering you a gift, and and if you t- if you step and take this gift, which He'll show you more clearly, but that's what He's asking of you today: to reach out and 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 say, in obedience, that you would do what He is offering you to do, and and your your path will your path will become much narrower than it is now. Um, there's probably things that. Uh, uh, you'll have to let go um, that um, to to follow this this. But when you go to your grave, you will know that you will have fulfilled God's God's plan for your life. And He's and He's telling you today. He's asking you today to to step up and seek Him about that. To seek Him about what He has. It is something that very different to what you have been doing. And, he, and it will require sacrifices. Um, but the Lord wants me to tell you that your family will not in any way suffer. And, but just be open to what he, he is showing you. He has heard your cry. He's heard your, um, uh, your asking and your um, sense that, well, what is it, God? What are you trying to tell me? And he wants you and puts you on that track. It will be a a, a narrower road. There'll be things that you probably have been doing that you, you, I'd say there has been things that you've done that are all all right, but but a lot of those things will have to um, drop away. But the but the rewards are so much greater than anything you might give up. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. That's the operating of the word of knowledge, and we we believe the scriptures. Amen. And sometimes it is true, you know, sometimes, and I think we've all experienced that, we're, we're looking for confirmation or um, some confirmation from God. And sometimes it, come in, it can come in the form of, of a word of knowledge and it gives us a lot more boldness to go ahead and do what we need to do, what we've even been thinking inside of our hearts but are unsure of. And these things are of God to confirm so that we can walk in his ways. Thank you so much, Mary and team, for leading us around uh, the throne of God in worship. And um, yes, give me a hand of encouragement. Wonderful. Praise God.
Well, we've got some, um, some visitors here today. I've met uh, Eileen and Ernie at the door. They're from um, Swansea in New South Wales. Well, welcome to church. Welcome to Townsville Worship Centre. Is there any other new, new people here, first people that have come here for the first time? No? Pe oh, well, they're not first-timers. We know Peter and Sue. So Peter and Sue and also Pastor Mike and Pastor Irene Delcino as well. And I think that's all the people. Yeah, wonderful. Let's, so let's give our um, people another hand of encouragement. Excuse me, I just have to change my glasses. That's better. That's much better. Wonderful. Okay, let's get into some announcements. Um, um, and before we do, we're just going to pray for the tithes and offerings. Thank you for your faithful giving. Um, it's been amazing that, um, you know, the amount of money that's been raised from this church and also further afield as well, just for simply from putting out the need of what's been happening in Ukraine. Um, it's, it's blessed um, the people there. Um, it's the fives and tens. Um, I'll just give you a, a little bit of a testimony, just what happened while I was driving on Friday. Um, uh, someone came into the into my car, drove him to his destination on the way. He asked, what do you do? Do you only do Uber driving? I said, no, I work for an, a not-for-profit as well. And they said, oh, what you, what's that? And I said, oh, I work for a church group. And he said, and what do you do in the church group? I said, well, apart from, you know, um, you know talking about Jesus and everything like that and, you know, teaching people um, about the gospel. We also do a lot of humanitarian work. And I said, we've also, um, in particular, we're focusing on what's happening in, in Ukraine and because um, we've had 30-plus um, years of involvement there. And he, he began to say, well, yes, it's a very sad situation. So um, as I dropped him off at his desti destination, he was rummaging through his wallet. And um, he said, I know it's not much, but please accept this as a do donation towards what's happening there. So, you know, it's wonderful. So even people that um, uh, I would say probably he was either a Hindu or something like that, but... But people, you know, when they hear of needs, they respond. Amen? Praise God. So as the tithes and offerings are being collected, we're just going to pray. Father, we just thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. Father, we thank you that every promise in you is yes and amen. And Father, we do want to be walking in the way, Father God, that as we do walk in the way, Lord, we're led by you. And Father, we ask you that, Lord, as we give to you, that, Father, your work would be prospered in this place, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, Amen as the tithes and offerings are being collected. Uh, prayer meeting at 9.30 a.m. Uh, every Sunday morning. If you're able to make it, um, please do. If you don't see anybody in the room, just go in and start praying for God's presence to be in this place. Amen. Also, Tuesday prayer meeting at Pastor Tony and Eunice's place. Um, at 10 a.m., 6 Fairway Close in Kerwin, uh, we are focusing on the present situation in Ukraine as well as all that's been happening in, um, in Australia, in, in uh, northern New South Wales and uh, southern Queensland with the floods. We understand that a lot of people have been flooded for the three times in, in one year, so they do need lots of prayer as well. So, uh, and also other, other situations. Uh, this year is a, um, an election year as well, so we want to gather together in prayer that we will have the government that God desires, not the government that we deserve because we don't deserve much. But let's, let's gather together and pray. So that's happening at 10 a.m. on Tuesday at Pastor Tony and Eunice's place at 6 Fairway Close. Tonight at 5 p.m. there will be a gala night at 6 Fairway Close. Bring lots of food, bring yourselves, and it'll be a lovely time of worship, informal fellowship, food, and I think there might be a baptism as well. We're not sure, but if there is, they'll be wonderful. Baptisms are always wonderful, aren't they? Amen. So that's happening tonight, starting from 5 p.m. Uh, also, Wednesday night, our uh, Bible study uh, will be streamed from uh, Pastor, Face Pastor Tony's Facebook page. Uh, there might be some changes. We had a few technical issues last uh, Wednesday, but uh, they are being fixed. Uh, also, the Easter concert at Parkland's Nursing Home, uh, that's coming up on uh, Saturday the 9th of April. Uh, it's a, a, it starts at 10 o'clock. Um, 
uh, if you could be there at 9.45. If you want to be involved, uh, please see Eunice. You will, re you will require to be, um, uh, have a, a flu injection and also proof of that as well. So um, if you want further details, please see Eunice as well. Um, also, um, Easter, uh, the Good Friday service is coming up on the 15th of uh, April, and that'll be just a short service from 9 to 10 a.m. Uh, so that's um, Good Friday, the 15th of April. And there'll be no Logos on today. So, um, and uh, that is about, well, one, one other thing. Uh, someone had a birthday this week, um, Keziah. Where is Keziah? She's hiding. There she is. Let's encourage her. Yeah. And also for any other person that's had a birthday as well, if you'd like us to announce and to celebrate your birthday, please fill out a card. They're in the foyer area, and then we can make a fuss over you because we'll know your birthday. <laughs> okay, that's about, that's about it for, um, for the announcements. But um, we're going to come around the communion table, and uh, as the communion is being distributed... Um, I, I always had very strong um, memories as a kid with, um, with Easter, um, uh, growing up in the Catholic Church. Um, I always had very vivid um, you know, um, memories of, of Easter service, going to church um, on Easter. And... Um, but it wasn't until I came to, to faith and uh, became born again, I, I really started looking at things in a new light. If the communion could be distributed, please. Yeah, thank you. And um, coming up to Easter, the first, the first thing that's being celebrated is um, Palm Sunday. And I always remember the little, you know, palm things made into a, a cross and always, you know, leaving church having one of those. And... Um, and looking, looking like Palm Sunday is coming uh, next Sunday, and um, Jesus was coming into Jerusalem as, or he was being received into Jerusalem as a king. And, and in each of the four Gospels, that account is given. And there are some very slight variations in, um, in the, the accounts. All of them talk about, you know, Hosanna in the highest and glory to, to God, you know, uh, and they mention... Jesus as the king of uh, um, the son of David, so he was being uh, welcomed in as a king. Uh, also, in in one of the accounts, it mentions him as Jesus the prophet. So he's mentioned, received as a king, but also mentioned as a prophet. And we all know that Jesus fulfills all three roles as prophet, priest, and king in his person. And, um, but they didn't recognize him as priest because Israel said, well, the priests are in Jerusalem, but Jesus, is, we are receiving him as a king. And, um, and notice also, too, that when he came as a king, he came, it, the, the, um, the, the scriptures say, depending on which uh, version, it says he was lowly and sitting on a donkey. That's not very kingly, is it, when you think about that sort of thing? It's, it's not very kingly at, at all. So he was a, a humble king. He came and was received as a king, but though he didn't look like a king, he was given praise. And the book of Hebrews describes Jesus in this way. And I, I think we, we need to take note of why the, this book was written. Because so much of of Israel was consumed with the kingdom of God or the kingdom of Israel being established. But Jesus came as a king to conquer another enemy, and that enemy was sin and death. And this is what the book of Hebrews says of Jesus, describes him as. It says in, in Hebrews uh, 2:17 to 18, it describes him as a merciful, faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. In Hebrews 3.1, it describes him as the apostle and high priest of our confession, an apostle, a forerunner, the one that goes into uncharted ground and establishes something. 
In Hebrews 5, 5 to 6, it talks about Jesus as being a priest forever. Because in the mind of Israel, priests were being continually changed every generation. So there was nothing that was enduring. But Jesus is a priest forever. In Hebrews 7, 20, 7 26 to 27, it says, For uh, he was a high pr- um, a high, he was a high priest who was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. So... Israel was not only looking for, they were not looking for a priest. But Jesus came as a priest, in the office of a priest. And he, being priest, offered himself up. He didn't require an animal as an offering. He offered himself up. And then lastly, Hebrews 8.1. And this is whoever the the writer to the Hebrews is, says, Now this is the main point of all the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Jesus Christ became like us, became a priest who offered a perfect sacrifice now is at the right hand of God, the Father, interceding on our behalf. We have in our hands very simple emblems of what Christ did for us. And I think sometimes God, God knows that we need simple things, doesn't he? We get distracted with complicated things. Even though the, the gospel is, is extremely detailed, with all the types and shadows and the historical events which are so vivid in what they speak. But sometimes it's like what the writer says. Now this is the main point. This is the main point. And in our hands it says that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. Something very simple. He took bread. He broke it and he said, take eat. This is my body which was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake. And in the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, not the blood of bulls nor the blood of goats. Do this as often, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's partake. So for as often as we do this, which we do every Sunday, we eat this bread, we drink this cup, we are proclaiming the Lord's death, his resurrection, his perfect sacrifice, until he comes. Jesus is coming again. Amen? Amen. Let's welcome Pastor Tony as he comes and shares with us. Good morning, everyone. Oh, that's good. Now, tonight's Scala night, so some folk uh, who travel quite a distance every Sunday uh, have opted because they're taking part in the uh, worship tonight. They didn't come up this morning from Air, Home Hill, um, but um, they'll be here in strength tonight. So I hope you will be too. You're welcome to our house. And um, we uh, 
love to open our home because uh, it's not our home, it's his. He gave it to us and he gave it to us for a purpose and that's to share it with you and we want you to feel at home. Now that doesn't mean you take the silver and the glass and the china unless you pay me at the door but you're most welcome to come. Bring oodles of food and... um, We'll just have a wonderful time together. Tonight I believe we're going to have a time of worship and uh, it'll be mainly waiting on God and worshipping him and uh, really touching God and being touched by him. Uh, Quite a few uh, folk are not well uh, at the moment and so we need to pray for those and I will in a a moment. I'm being uh, profoundly exercised. I like that word. Uh, exercise has been a, a bad word in my vocabulary uh, over the years, but exercised in spirit. I believe that Jesus Christ is coming again. Good, I'm glad you do, because if you don't, you're way behind. But I believe he's coming. I believe that uh, to the degree that you believe anything in the scriptures, it will affect your life. It will challenge you. It will shake you. It will determine for you how you will receive the Lord. Now, I've never been very religious. I wasn't religious. I wasn't brought up in a religious home. In fact, my father uh, scorned it in a, a, in a good-natured way. He was a bit cheeky. And, uh, but uh, he hated religion. He hated that which was merely form and ritual but lacked reality. And I want to tell you, when I got born again on the 15th of March 1959, 13 years of age, something happened in my life and it wasn't religion. I knew something happened. Now, I was totally ignorant of biblical teaching and spiritual things. I had not a clue. But I tell you what, I knew something had happened. Something had begun in my heart, my life, and my spirit. And that's probably what happened in your life. I hope so. I hope you're not just a church person. (laughs) Can't bear the thought. Because, you see, the Bible talks about a form of godliness that denies the power thereof. And there are a lot of people that I meet, even under our own banner, in our own fellowship denomination who I believe have got a form of godliness but they don't have the impacting power of the gospel. They're lazy, they're they're dull, they're selfish, soulish and uh, they even think God is just there for them. Well, I'm telling you that none of that is true and they're going to get a terrible, terrible shock on the day of his appearing. The Bible talks about a rapture of the church. It doesn't use that term. But it talks about the event. And friends, I want to tell you, you've got to be ready to be going. And you need to start girding up the loins of your mind and start putting yourself in the centre of the picture and the focal point of your life. You've got to put the Lord first. Amen. You won't be popular. You won't, be, uh, you won't be welcomed in some circles. But friends, who cares? Who cares? <laughs> I couldn't care less. All I want to know is when the Lord comes, I'll hear his voice say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Amen. Amen. So don't be lazy. And get ready because I believe the Lord is really challenging us and uh, really drawing us in. We're going to have a wonderful time of fellowship tonight around the presence of God. It won't be another preaching. It'll be a time of fellowship together, lots of food. And I saw a great casserole being cooked at our place uh, today. I tell you what, it looks as though it could uh, feed about 3,000 people. But don't put too much store by that because I exaggerate. Uh, it's probably only going to fit 
into the bellies of about 2,000 people. But the thing is, we would like you to come bring food, come and have fellowship, and then out there on that lovely veranda, uh, we're going to sit back and allow the South Sea music to flow, and we're going to worship the Lord, and we're going to pray for one another and for real healings to take place. Because I believe that what's, that's the focus, to have the breath of God upon us. That's what God wants in these final days. Do you remember that beautiful psalm? You probably can say it off by heart. If you are a little older than the last uh, 15, 20 years, you probably learnt this 23rd psalm by heart. Most Sunday school children of yesteryear learned the Lord's Prayer, as it has been called, and they learned the 23rd Psalm. I can almost say it now myself without looking to the pages of the Scripture. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, and he... Yes. And then, what about verse 3? He restores my soul. You know, one of the dangers of being so familiar with even the Scriptures is that that's what happens. We become familiar. That's how relationships break down with people. We become familiar. That's how we lose respect for people. We become familiar. That's how we lose our way in life. We become familiar. We take people, we take things, we take values, we take privileges for granted. And one of the worst factors is that we can do that with the scriptures. We can take the scriptures for granted. And just like a parrot, we can, we can so easily, because of memory, because of being trained, we can parrot fashion, just say the scriptures, and they sort of dribble out of our mouths, but they don't have any impact on our lives. That's why we need to be praying all the time for the moving and the ministry and the impact of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I don't trust myself. I don't believe in myself as being able to be a true custodian of anything of value. I believe that you can easily fall into traps and this beautiful psalm has so much in it that even if you had no other psalm to rely on, that will fit you, prepare you, and provide for you and protect you for time and eternity. It's a brilliant psalm. But I want to talk about this verse 3 the first phrase of it, because there are a number of phrases. It says there in verse 3, He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. There are lots of things there, but I want to draw that text this morning. He restores my soul. And I want to leave that there, and I want to step back and think, and talk about and focus on the need for the restored soul. Nothing will wreck your soul more than sin. That's Satan's design and desire to wreck you, to break you, to bind you, to deluge you, to defeat you to decimate you and to damn you. That's Satan. But Jesus said in John chapter 10, though the thief comes to steal, to kill and destroy, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. 
What a contrast. Who wants to be stolen from? Who wants to be degraded? Who wants to be pummeled? Who wants to be controlled by darkness? I don't. I don't. I want the freedom, the abundance. I remember as an 11-year-old watching television two years before I really entered into the born-again experience, and I watched everything. I mean, I, when television first came to Australia in 1956, it came right at the end of the year, and they had all kinds of test programs for about three or four or five months before the Olympic Games in Melbourne. And television was uh, brought on to uh, start then so that they could televise the Olympic Games. <clears throat> and for you all that are so young, won't know this, but I remember the, even the local petrol station cleared out its uh, uh, area where they fixed the cars and scoured it and put chairs around and at the local Ampol station we all went from about three o'clock in the afternoon uh, straight from school and sat down and someone went over and turned on the black and white TV size 24 inch and we all sat there and were transfixed. Well, I became an addict. I had no interest in sport. I didn't even know who Betty Cuthbert was or Lorraine Crapp or uh, Emil Zatopek, but they became names to me, even though I couldn't care less what they achieved on the sporting field, because I was addicted. I was transfixed by this marvellous new phenomena called television. And then my father said to me, I'm waiting until Astor brings out its 21-inch. Uh, I'm not having a 17-inch one because it's on little sticks. Or, and he said, I don't want that in the, in the lounge room. I want a nice classy one with French polished wood. I don't want a size 24-inch because it's blurry. So he'd done his research. And the day came when the television arrived. Ah, oh, we had our own television. He was so pedantic, he wouldn't even allow a television aerial to be put on the roof. It had to be inside the roof because it spoiled the decor of our lovely home. <laughs> Things you remember about your childhood. I had a very happy childhood, but I had mad parents. And, of course, they had even a madder son. But anyway, I just got hooked. The first thing I would do, television didn't come on until the afternoon and uh, mid-afternoon it came on with some sort of play show. I watched that. It was, for t it was for kindergarten age. I was 11 but I watched that. I would have sat there and watched the test pattern I was so addicted. But one afternoon, a Sunday afternoon, I flicked it on my parents were out in the garden, we had a beautiful garden at our house, and they were loved to just be together, mum and dad. Didn't want me chattering around, and used to send me away. And uh, it worked for me too, because when I once went to do the dishes on a, an evening, they told me to go away because they wanted personal time together. So that suited me. I never washed a dish until I was 19, never made a bed until I was 19. <laughs> but if you think that's bad, Philip here, he never polished his shoes until he was a grown man. His mother and my mother were lady friends. They were great girlfriends. And men didn't do anything domestic. How we have changed. Well, some of us have. I turned the television on while the family were out in the garden. Parents were out in the garden. My brother was out. And I saw a show that I think was called This Is Life. And it was enacted. 
And at the end, they had an illuminated scripture. John chapter 10. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And you know, even as an 11-year-old sitting there, I saw that and I thought to myself, I want that abundant life. I want that life. Not religious? Oh yes, been to Sunday schools. Um, I liked religious instruction in the school. I liked the songs and hymns. I liked it all. I was sentimentally attached to it, but I wasn't born again. But when I saw that scripture, the abundant life, I thought that's the kind of life I want. I don't want a second-rate life. I don't want an existence. I want a life. I want a life that's abundant. And the Amplified Version says it so beautifully, life until it overflows. I thought, that's what I want. And you know, I don't know that I can say this conclusively, but I think some of those convictions that we received when we were kids impacted us, impressed us, and were indeed the Spirit of God speaking to us. And I think of all the meanderings that I have done, not terribly dangerous ones, but, you know, wandered off track and got caught up with lesser things, I think I've come back to that time and time and time again. That's why I'm sad for people that live a mundane existence. I'm not going to live that kind of life. I'm going to live life till it's full, to that last breath, on earth. I'm not going to let life dictate to me what I and over and above what I've chosen to do and that is to follow Jesus Christ. But I don't want to just follow him and his creed without the impact of a relationship with him. I don't want to be religious and I certainly don't want to be a slob that sits around and grabs everything that he'll give and give nothing in return. I want to spend my life enjoying that abundance that he promised. Sin wrecks you. Sin diabolically takes you into darkness and hell. And every one of us, whether we were deliberately sinful or in a secondary sense affected by it, our own sins or someone else's, he restores my soul. What a ministry the Spirit has in restoring my soul. And you know, it's not until he begins to unveil to you and reveal to you the immensity of that wrecking ball of sin that you realise how much you need restoration. You need restoration. You need restoration. Now, what is that word restoration? To be restored, it means to be taken from where you're existing now and bringing you back to the plane that was originally intended. You know, you get people that restore houses or restore cars or restore things. And what are they doing? They are bringing it back to the ultimate intention and the level and the state that was meant to be. And when he restores my soul, God brings me back to a place that he intends me. To enjoy. So are you restored? Are you restored? Are you or are you just forgiven? 
There's a difference. You can be forgiven and never restored. You can be going to heaven, but living a depleted life. You can have had God say to you, and for eternity, I forgive you. You are free, and you're still not changed. You've never been restored. But the psalmist who had, and I was reading this this morning in my Bible reading, he was, he was a wreck of a man. You know, David was a wreck. He wrecked his own life. He wrecked his family. A man of privilege, of kingship and authority, of blessing, and chose to be reckless. And he ruined his whole family, splintered that family. But he was able to say, he restores my soul. You know, friends, <clears throat> sometimes there are people that have never been restored financially, never restored physically, not entirely restored maritally, though there's been destruction in all of those levels, but they've had their soul restored. Now that's interesting, isn't it? It's not a unilateral promise that God's going to restore everything. Because it doesn't always happen. When you wreck your marriage, you've affected other people. And for that to be restored, they have to have that willingness to come to the party so that you can be reconciled and each forgiving one another to move to the next level. And that may never happen. But you can have a restored soul. You can have a restored soul. And I've met people who've said to me, well, my sin lost me so much. My stupidity and the decisions I made, the foolish acts of a disobedient heart got me into so much trouble and I am reaping that which I sowed but inside I'm restored he restores my soul may not be able to restore that marriage may not be able to restore your fortunes he may not be able to restore your health because of the damage that's done He's restored your soul. About eight weeks ago, I talked about Mari, who came into our church utterly mad, absolutely mad. I don't know what happened in her life. I know she was brought up in a beautiful Christian home. She turned her back on the Lord and married a nice man, a nice man, but he was totally godless. That is, uh, what is godless? Oh, well, that's God. That's what it is. You know, didn't want God. And she sinned against her conscience in marrying him and against her mother's pleas, her godly mother who'd been a widow since her 30s and brought up four children and they all were serving the Lord until Mari broke out and married Mr. Glamour Chops. And he won her over with his charm and then whistled away her faith. And though he accumulated a lot of money and wealth, and they had lovely kids, and I know them, I know what I'm talking about, and lived in the splendour of the beautiful suburb in Melbourne where they lived, little by little something began to erode underneath in her spirit, and she began to fragment 
First it was emotionally and then it was mentally until in the ages of 48, 46 through to 55 she became a mental wreck and became uh, a patient, a live-in patient at our, what we used to call 45 years ago, an asylum. She was in the Mont Park Asylum. But she called on the name of the Lord. And my brother-in-law now with the Lord, Ian, was wonderful to her. And he would pick her up, mad as mad as mad some days. And he would pick her up and bring her to church. <clears throat> Not everybody in church can cope with everybody that comes through the door. We understand that. Don't, don't do yourself an injury if you think, oh, well, that person's not my cup of tea. It's not that you don't like them, you just can't cope with them. And there's reasons for it, perhaps. And a lot of people did feel when Mari came in looking crazy that, oh, glad Ian's looking after her. I don't have to. But we, we liked her, didn't we, Innes? She had been a very pretty girl, you know. You never lose that. Even when you're... A, I had an aunt that was 94. We were sitting in a funeral, waiting for the funeral to start, and, and she reached over and tapped me on the shoulder, and she said, Tony. And I said, yes, aunt. I turned around. She said, I'm 94. Oh, I said, I'm younger than you, I'm 93. <laughs> beautiful. She was, even in her 95th year, she was the most beautiful woman. She never lost that. You don't lose that. Some of you girls, you, you know, you, your teeth are fallen out <laughs> and you've had replacements. We're not talking about you. And, and you've, you know, you have to colour your hair and put a little extra spackle and polish and paint on. But really, I want to tell you, 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 we can see you were a stunner. You were a stunner. Probably too much of you now, but that's all right. That's something. <laughs> Mari was like that. You know, her medication had bloated her. Her mind was subdued, it wasn't healed. She never got her mind back. But God restored her soul. And Ian brought her to church, and I told you this story, but for those that didn't hear, it's beautiful. She came to church, and, and as he was greeting somebody at the door, in those days the deacon stayed at the door and handed out a hymn book and talked and welcomed people, as he stopped to receive his hymn book and talk, she got away. And the singing and the worship was beautiful and, and she pirouetted down and down and down and down and down, turning and turning and turning until she got to the front of the church. And then she started to lift her hands and dance and my poor brother-in-law up at the end, <laughs> oh, I let her go. <laughs> And everybody was, uh, this is interesting. And then she finished and she knelt and lifted her hands. And I was the only one that could see it because I was on the platform. Her face shone like an angel. And Ian came down and took her back to her seat. And there she stayed. And everything went on then from that point. Took him back, took her back to Mount Park. It was lunchtime. And when he handed her over at the door, the nurse in charge said, Hello, Mari, did you have a lovely time at church? And Mari said, It was heavenly, heavenly. And Ian said, Well, I'll see you. See you next week, Mari. Well, he didn't see her because she went to the dining room and sat down. And she went to say grace. They put a bowl of something in front of her and she went to say grace. And someone said, Mary, you can eat now. 
Mary, you can eat now. She's gone. The Lord took her home. And that dance was a dance of adoration. And the Lord took her home that day. But you know, that scripture came to me time and time and time and time and time again. He restores my soul. So I'll see her in the glory and I'll recognise her, but not in comparison to what she was, but what she has become. Because restoration in God ultimately will be total. And you know, if we meet people that because of their folly, their sin, their stupidity, their criminality, whatever, have damaged themselves mentally, emotionally and physically, we are to love them and care for them and welcome them and support them, knowing that what hasn't been restored to this point one day will be restored. This mortal, with all its mortality, will put on immortality. He restores my soul. That's the point. He restores my soul. And what are the soul? What are, what are the components of the soul? Well, there are three. And medical science complies with the scriptural description of the soul. What is it? Well, it's your mind, your intellect, your emotions, and your will. That's your soul. And that never dies. That remains for eternity. You'll be thinking in eternity. And you will have memory in eternity. Did you know that? Oh, yes, you'll remember. You'll remember time. You'll remember events. People say, oh, no, I don't want to remember mine. You will remember it with perspective. You will be able to remember, but you'll see things in the bigger picture. So your mind. You know, Mary was restored in her mind to the degree that she returned to the God of her father and mother. And she had a faith that was intellectual. It did involve her mind because that's why she worshipped him so beautifully. Emotionally, she was damaged by her husband. His, I suppose really his insensitivity to the fact that she was a believer. As a non-believer, he could have said to her, if he really loved her, he would have said, well, Mary, I don't share your faith. And I don't share your commitment and I don't share your love for Christ. I don't even believe in it. But darling, if that makes you happy, I want you to be happy. You go to church. But he didn't do that. He robbed her and he ripped her, uh, the faith that she had out of her soul. And that's what damaged her. Because, you see, that was the equilibrium of a life. And when you took that out, she imploded. But that was restored to her. Marvellous, isn't it? Now I want to talk to you about something else in the few minutes that I've got. God restores souls. And you, if you feel tattered, torn... You don't want believism. You, you want a supernatural relationship with God. Not just token testimony, but the testimony of a changed life. Where you pass from death unto life. Where you just haven't said, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Well, devils believe in Jesus and they tremble. And if you believe and never tremble, you don't believe really. 
No. He restores and liberates and captivates, convicts and converts and consecrates the soul. Marvelous. If you're the same old bag you used to be, nasty and twisted and jealous and gossip, well, I don't think you're born again, darling. I don't think you're born again. I think you've got a, an intellectual faith, but it hasn't restored your soul. So the Lord is into restoring. Restoring, restoring. Challenge me about it. Ask me about it. Argue if you want about it. But I know this is true. Restored souls. That's what conversion is. That's what being born again is. That's what being quickened according to Ephesians 2.1 is. That's... 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are passed away, and behold, the new has come. That's a restored soul. And you know there are restored paths. Restored paths. You were on a path. We used to sing number 671 in the chorus book. I'm walking along a heavenly road Since Jesus took all my sins away Well, some people get off that path. Some girl gets caught away emotionally with some handsome dude who becomes an ugly devil and loses her way. And it happens on the other side too. Some damsel, you know, looks like Goldilocks, but I tell you what, she's the witch of Endor. And you're stupid. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Because you believed in Cupid. And became stupid. But I tell you what. There comes a day when you wake up and you say to yourself. I've been stupid, stupid, stupid. I've mucked my life up. And then. You say I want a restored soul. I want to get back to the Lord. I want to come back to him. And then the Lord says, well, the same path is before you. Because remember Psalm 23? He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness. So when your soul is restored, he takes you by the hand and says, hey, remember this path? And as Lillian felt led to say this morning, it's narrow because Jesus said so. Broad is the way that leads to where? Destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to life eternal. It is the path of righteousness. And it's the prophet who said, show me the old way. The restored path to dwell in. A restored path. And then there's, for all of us, especially those that have become, in some way, shape or form, disillusioned. You know, you've got to watch disillusionment. How many... Photos have you seen, wedding photos. Remember that time your cousin came to visit us in Adelaide? Oh, what a rough house rosy she was. Oh, I thought, what have I married into? Oh, God. She was rough. Olive skin like 
Philip because they had the same heritage. But oh, you know, she might have been olive skinned like Eunice's mother, but I tell you what, she didn't have that pure heart. She sat down and Eunice's father whom, and mother, whom she'd come to see in our house, was sitting beside her because he was deaf, you see, and he wanted to hear every word she said. And he said, Tony and Eunice have been married for 18 months. Oh, she said, you got any wedding photos? So Eunice gets this wedding album and carries it out. It must have cost her the earth. It was that heavy. And she plonked it in this cousin's lap. And the girl, woman, opened it up and read through and looked at it. And she said these words. And this was 1971. I've never forgotten it. 51 years ago. She said, you ought to keep this book, she said. Because when everything goes wrong... You turn to this book and remember how it used to be. Isn't that awful? Well, the beautiful thing is that that rough house thing came to some meetings we were running and got born again. And she's on fire for the Lord today. And she's been up here and you wouldn't have known. She was the most transformed woman I think I've ever met. Amazing grace. Because that's her name, Grace. Amazing grace. And all that harshness and horror has gone. Her mother was godly and her mother prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. Ignored the roughness, ignored the abuse, ignored the swearing, ignored the meanness, and ignored it. Wouldn't listen, wouldn't listen, wouldn't listen. And she was an old tongue speaking mother. <laughs> we went to visit her when she was in a nursing home. And she was in the Salvation Army home that had been bequeathed to them. A magnificent mansion in a leafy street in Adelaide. We went to see Aunt Anne. And I said to the lady in the foyer, the Salvationist, I said, oh, look, we've come to see Mrs. Anne so-and-so. Uh, she's my wife's auntie. Oh, <laughs> go to the top floor. Well, there's only one floor above us. Go to the top floor. She's on the veranda. So we went there and there was this dear old lady. And I loved her and I love her memory today. She was true blue. So we talked, oh, darlings, she said, in a voice like a foghorn. Oh, darlings. So we sat and talked to her. And then after about 40 minutes, we thought it's time to go. We're on this veranda looking into this very sedate street with people walking by with their Afghan, you know, and, and fancy dogs and poodles and everything by. You know. And, of course, you could hear her echoing right down the road. And I said, Auntie, I said, before we go... Eunice and I would like to pray with you. Wow! She started speaking in tongues. I think the whole of Adelaide heard. <laughs> oh, oh, shut her up. I looked at Eunice and Eunice says, sublime, <laughs> caught away, loves it all. I was embarrassed. People down on the street were, and I felt like saying she's a Macedonian and gone crazy, but I didn't know what to say. She, she was letting fly. But you know that woman, 40 years before, had terminal cancer. And the Adelaide Hospital rang a very undignified grace, who was herself a nurse, and said, you better come and get your mother She's got three days to live. Better for her to die at home amongst those she loves. 
So Jack Gracie got in the car and went down and got her. And as they were wheeling dear Aunt Anne out, well, she said, she was skin and bone. Oh, well, she said, I won't see you folk anymore. And they all burst into tears. And she couldn't work it out. And they got her into the car and helped her in. She said, Gracie, why were those people crying? Oh, she said, Mummy, it's because you said that you won't see them anymore. No, she said, I won't. She said, uh, they think you'll be dead in a couple of days. Oh, is that why they cried? Oh, how stupid. No, I'm going to be healed, she said. I won't see them because I don't need to go back to hospital. And she lived for another 40 years. Eunice and Philip have got the maddest of relations. <laughs> Look who they married into. But I want to tell you, they've got relatives that touch God. They believe in the restoration gospel. Hallelujah. Gracie is now 90 what? Eunice 5? She's 95 and still going for God. Our gospel is Jesus' gospel. We've embraced it. He declared it, we believe it, and he restores. He restores a soul. He restores a path. He restores hope. He restores a call. He restores for Israel a land that he never gave away. Amazing. Amazing. He's a God of restoration. What do you think about that? Shall we stand? So what do you need to do? Your homework. You, want to, you need to be honest with yourself. You say, now look, you know, all very well, Tony. That's all nice. You know, love, love all that. Well, what a failed message. If that's all it is. I want you to say to yourself, have I rest a restored life? Is my life restored? Or am I living a Christianized but not really a converted life? I am born again. I am saved. I am going to heaven because of my faith in Jesus. But am I truly restored to the perfect will of God. Well, are you? Are you? Well, only you can answer. I don't, you don't have to, you never have to answer to me. I'm not God. But God's got something for you. He wants to restore your soul. He wants to bless you. I sat in my prayer closet this morning, which is my library study, and I said, Lord God in heaven. You know, I just feel as though I'm as fresh as a daisy today. I feel as though I'm just starting out. I have a freshness in my spirit. I have a verve in my soul. I have a stamina in my body. I have a virility in my faith today. Why? Because of the continual restoring of God. And that's what the scripture says. And if you're 110 this morning, this is a word from the Lord for you. As thy days, so shall thy strength be. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you believe that? As thy days. I don't care whether it's 10 days, 50 days, 100 days, 100 years. 
To die, my mother had to ask me to pray for her to go. Because she said, I'm bored. And I want to get to heaven. I said, I'm not doing that. I said, imagine me praying for my mother to die. I said, I've already got your money. I don't need you to die. (laughs) Well, she thought it was funny. Where do you think I got it from? But I want to tell you this. There is a life you can live that's better than the one you would choose for yourself. You can have the dignity, the grace, the authority, the power, the health, the strength, the blessing, the peace, the anointing of a restored life. And if you want it, stick your hand in the air and I'll pray for you. If you don't want it, well, I'll take yours for you. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray. Oh, come on, lift your hand to the Lord and say, Lord, I am a candidate for blessing. I thank you, Father, for restoration. I thank you that I'm not going to collapse. I am not going to pine away. I'm not going to die a dismal life. I am not going to be a fold-up wreck. I am going to be restored. And you said you would restore from these years when the canker worm got in and bit away and bit away and devoured areas of my life. I will be restored. Hallelujah. I will live a powerful life. I will live a joy-filled life. I will live a soul that is energised. By the Spirit of God. Amen. I break the power of the avenger, the destroyer, the one who is the accuser, the one who tries to wreck and destroy you. I come against him in the name of Jesus and I break those chains of addiction. I break those chains of demonic power and control. I break them right now. I break the chains of affliction and infirmity and I break that sour spirit that has been resentful. Because of loss. And I say, live again. Live again. Live again. And all the people shouted. They really said, Amen. Hallelujah. Was that a bit loud for you? Too bad. Too bad. Too bad. I believe in it. God bless you. Have some cake. Have some coffee. Have a rest this afternoon. Come over with the most awful fattening food you can get and let's have a wonderful time. Have a shindig in Jesus. Amen.